Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. In today's video, we're going to go over PD arrays and the logic behind their formation and their delivery. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so always as a quick preface, PD arrays are the key levels that price is coming from and going to. And PD arrays are the signatures in price that price will change its state of delivery from. And we can enhance our understanding of price when we understand the logic behind each of the PD arrays. So let's break down what I just said. So I say um, initially that PD arrays are the key levels that price is coming from and going to. So let's say that we have a price delivery that looks like this. So obviously price is wanting to come lower. So when it's coming lower, that means that it's seeking a discount or a bullish PD array, right? So it's coming towards this PD array. And then we need to understand that there was something to the left that sent us lower because up until that point, price was, you know, probably coming higher and then it changed its state of delivery from here. And then it started going lower and it's seeking another PD array, you know, for it to potentially change its state of delivery from again. So that's what I mean when I say that price is coming from and going to PD arrays. All right, and then this part right here is also important. So PD arrays are the signatures and price that price will change its state of delivery from. So anytime that price is turning around, it's going to be at one of those seven PD arrays, right? So you can try and go and find a example of where price, you know, wants to turn around from thin air, but you can't, right? Every single time that price is turning around, I can guarantee you that there is a PD array that it hit to the left that caused it to you know turn around from and in today's video the most important thing that we're going to go over is to not just understand you know like what a pd array looks like but to understand like the reasoning behind how it's forming so the reason that i want to do that for you guys is so that once you guys are better able to understand the delivery as opposed to just seeing a pattern you guys will be able to better, you know, tape read the markets. And once you guys are able to better tape read, you can hunt for better setups. And, you know, when you hunt for better setups, you end up finding better trades. And ultimately, you know, that's going to um, positively impact your equity curve. All right. So that's our preface. Now let's move on to the next slide. All right. So before we even go on to talking about the actual PD arrays, let's talk about stops to inefficiencies. All right, so before adding additional layers to our understanding of logical price delivery, we need to understand that the markets are moving from sell side liquidity to buy side liquidity and from buy side liquidity to sell side liquidity. And as it's doing that, it is creating imbalance and it's rebalancing those imbalances. And this is what gives us the stops to inefficiencies mental framework. So the reason that I included this is because as I mentioned in that last slide, we're talking about understanding the delivery. We're understanding how the algorithm is printing price. So in order for us to do that, we need to understand the most basic thing that the algorithm is trying to do, which is first, it's you know seeking liquidity. And second, it's wanting to rebalance old inefficiencies. Outside of those two parameters, there's not a lot that price is doing. You know, like these are the two things or these are the only two things that the algorithm is really interested in. It's going from stops or it's seeking liquidity and it's rebalancing old imbalances. All right. So with that being said, let's move on to our PD array list. Oh, and one more thing before we move on to the PD arrays. Um, in this video, the PD arrays that I'm teaching you guys aren't in any specific order other than, you know, um, whether we use them a lot in our trading at if to X or not. So at IPTA X, we mainly focus on inefficiencies, stops, and mitigation blocks, breakers, and order blocks. We don't necessarily, you know, talk too much about liquidity voids or rejection blocks because we don't necessarily use them a whole lot in our trading. We understand them, but we don't need every single PD array in our system. So that's why we're going to go over rejection blocks and liquidity voids uh, first, and then we'll talk about the delivery behind the other PD arrays um after we talk about those all right so let's start off with that rejection block 
So rejection blocks are simply just the long upper wicks of a high or the long lower wicks of a low that runs liquidity. So let's understand what's happening within this delivery. And this, or, or these two pictures are things that I took straight from ICT's core content. So in his rejection block uh, videos, he talks about this as well. So notice here how this candle, this candle's high, clears out this candle's liquidity, and then it creates that wick, and then price, you know, closes there, and then price comes back up with this candle. It reacts off of this wick, right? So it's reacting off of that level, and then price comes lower. So in this example, price is rejecting off of that rejection block, and that rejection block is going to be that wick of that candle that runs liquidity. So essentially, it's just the wick. But for rejection blocks, we want to see them run the liquidity of you know previous candles. And another thing that's important that ICT doesn't necessarily talk about in his rejection block video, but we want to see even bodies on the rejection blocks. So notice here how these candles have even bodies. And that's telling us that, you know, the delivery of these candles, it's not being permitted by the algorithm to go above or below this certain level right here. So that's another subtle thing that you should want to look for in your rejection blocks. All right. So now let's take a look at this picture. So right here, this candle runs the liquidity of these candles over here. And then price then goes higher. And then at a later point in time, price comes lower. And then it reacts off of this right here. And then as you guys can see, these candles right here have even bodies as well. So that's telling us that the algorithm isn't allowing price to go you know, much lower than this set level. And then price hits that. And then price reverses or changes its state of delivery from there. All right, so that's that rejection block. And one more thing, um, I don't necessarily have this in this diagram, but let me just draw it out for you. So let's say that we have liquidity, right? So let's just say that we're working within this range and then price comes up. And then let's say that it forms a rejection block, right? So here's a long wick. And then we do something like this. Um, actually, let's, let's make that a little bit better. So if price is, you know, just wicking through that liquidity and it's immediately rebalancing the range. So it's creating a rejection block. It's just taking out liquidity. It's forming those long wicks. And then it's immediately coming back inside the range. That's indicative of a opposing stop run. So that's another way that you can use rejection blocks. So let's say that you were wanting to be bullish. And then you're seeing this as price taking out liquidity. And then you're wanting for price to you know come back inside the inefficiency to then potentially go higher. If you're seeing rejection blocks form after taking out liquidity, you know, that's pretty indicative of a potential opposing stop run. So maybe instead of, you know, wanting to see that inefficiency, maybe you can allow for price to do something like this. So maybe price forms that rejection block, you allow for, you know, a potential a stop run over here, and then you can, you know, take longs or something like that after price hunts this up. So just a uh, crude depiction or a crude idea, but that's also another way that you can use um, rejection blocks and that's for those opposing stop runs. So as you guys can see right here in this example, let me get rid of this. Price takes out this liquidity. It doesn't close below that liquidity, right? It's forming this this other rejection block over here. I know that it doesn't have that um, that even body, but just understand this delivery right here. It's forming that rejection block here. And what happens next? We take out those opposing stops. So just another thing that I thought that I would mention here. All right, so that's that rejection block. Now let's move on to that next PD array. All right, so the next one is going to be liquidity voids. So a liquidity void is a range in price delivery where one side of the market liquidity is shown in long one-sided ranges or candles. So right here, you can see that the last time that price was really offered, the last time the price was offered efficiently was here. And then we just see that long one-sided delivery coming in here. So around this level, price is efficiently delivered, but still over here, we're still inefficient. 
right? So that would be our liquidity void. Now it's similar to a fair value gap, but a liquidity void can, you know, be characterized as, you know, maybe just a, uh, a bigger fair value gap or multiple uh, fair value gaps back to back because, you know, there's absolutely no buy side delivery or sell side delivery within that area, right? So the last time that price offered, in this case, buy side would have been over here, right? In order for us to come from here to here, right? So that's the buy side delivery. And then now there's absolutely no sell side delivery coming down all the way over here, right? So, so we're inefficient all the way up to here, as you guys have probably seen me use this example with levels of fair value, and we'll go over this again, but that's what's happening here. So the last time that price offered buy side was over here, or in this case right here. And then after that, it was just one-sided price delivery or heavy one-sided price delivery down. And then that is your liquidity void right there. So you don't need to get too technical with, um, you know, liquidity voids, fair value gaps. You know, if you understand the like how price is delivering, you'll be okay. But uh, that's, you know, that technical definition of a liquidity void. All right, so let's move on to the next example. All right, so fair value gaps. So a fair value gap is going to be something like this. So there's two types of these fair value gaps. So we have this buy side imbalance, sell side inefficiency, or this bullish fair value gap. Let me draw that a little bit better. So this is, this is that bullish fair value gap. And then here's that bearish fair value gap. All right, so what's happening here? So a fair value gap is a three candle formation. We have one, second candle, and this third candle right here. So when the upper wick of candle number one doesn't overlap with that lower wick of candle number three, that's when we have a fair value gap. So what's happening within the range of this candle is that there is no sell side delivery offered within that level. So let me actually make that a different color. So there's no selling within this area. There was no selling that was offered. There was only buying up until this area. So the last time that sell side delivery was offered was when we came down, right? So when we formed this wick, price came down and that was the last time that sell side delivery was offered and then after that it was just all buy side delivery you know up until this point so we offered sell side here but sell side isn't matched up with sell side over here so that's why this area right here is that fair value gap and we're inefficient or we're set to be inefficient at that area right so that's that fair value gap or that bullish fair value gap now let's discuss this one. So as I said, it's a three candle delivery. So candle number one, candle number two, candle number three right here. And same thing. So the last time that buy side delivery was offered was over here. So buy side up until this wick, right? So in order for us to get from, whoops, in order for us to get from here, to here, we need to buy up, right? So that's that last point of buy side delivery. And then here's that other point of buy side delivery from this wick up to this wick, right? So that's why those wicks are important, right? So actually to make this cleaner, we'll just say up to here. So buy side was offered up to there again, but anything between that was all sell side, right? So the last point of buy side was here. Last point of buy side was here. And those two areas don't overlap, right? So that lower wick of candle number one doesn't overlap with that upper wick of candle number three. So that's why we have this little inefficiency right here. And price, if it's, you know, if its intention is still to go lower, it could come up into here, offer that buy side delivery that it's looking for within this area, and then it'll come lower. So that's why price changes its state of delivery from inefficiencies, because if it still wants to go lower, it should want to offer some buy side, you know, offer some fair value within this area before coming lower, All right? So that's that logic behind the fair value gaps. All right, now let's move on to the next slide. All right, so the old highs and the old lows. So 
why does price change its state of delivery from old highs and old lows? Well, let's take a simple analogy. So let's say that you wanted to buy something. If you wanted to buy something, that means that there's people that need to be willing to sell to you. And if you want to sell something, that means that there needs to be people that are willing to buy from you. So what's happening at the highs? Well, at the highs, they're said to be buy stops, right? So buy stops here, all right? And then above the buy stops, there's willing buyers. So a buy stop is a type of order that says, okay, when price comes and hits this level, uh, you know, put me in a long position to go to go long, right? So there's there's people that are willing to buy at this level. And then what smart money does is they say, okay, there's buyers at this level and we want to go short. So let's, you know, pair up our short orders with the buyers and then, you know, we can take price lower. So that's why price will change its state of delivery from, you know, either the highs or the lows. So price came up into here. Smart money says, okay, we have enough counterparty for our short positions, or there's enough, you know, um, buy stops for us to pair up our, our sell orders with. So now we can begin to take price lower. So price takes out that liquidity and then price comes lower. All right. And then same thing here. So at this old low, there's sell stops, right? So there's people or market par market participants that say, okay, if price comes below this low, I want to be short. But smart money has other ideas. Smart money wants to go long. So what will they do? Smart money will take price below the old lows where they know that there's willing sellers. And then they'll pair up their short orders with the with you know their their long orders so they'll they'll pair up you know the other people's uh, short orders or sell stops with their buy stops and then they'll seek to take price higher from there All right so this idea of counterparty is that logic that you can use to understand why price you know reverses from these highs and these lows All right so that's the old highs and old lows now let's move on to that next example all right, so levels of fair value. So levels of fair value aren't necessar necessarily the seven PD arrays that ICT gives, but in order for us to understand the next couple of PD arrays, I want you guys to grasp this idea, right? Because we're not here to just understand a pattern. We're here to understand delivery, All right? So let's say that price is doing something like this and then price just plummets. Actually, let's let's draw that in a little bit better. So price does something like this, and then price plummets. So I've used this analogy before, and I'm going to use it again. So how does price get from point A up to point B? Well, it does so by buying up, right? So you can look at this entire delivery of price as a up-close candle. And then how does price get from point B down to point C, which is here? Well, it does so by selling off. All right, so right here, we've sold off. So at this point right here, at this level that I've marked off with this purple color, we are efficient, right? Buy side delivery has been paired up with sell side delivery and life is good over there. But after this point, after this line right here that I'm drawing in pretty thick, after this point, we're inefficient. Right, there's only sell side delivery. Right, so only sell side delivery. So, what price is going to want to do because markets seek fair value, price is going to want to come up at least to this area. And then, if it's still bearish from here, it can go lower. Right, so the market was efficient here, it was inefficient here. Or this was the last time that we, you know, that we efficiently traded. And then after that, it was all inefficient. So it's going to want to come back up into this area and make sure that everything is efficient. And then if it's still bearish, then it'll change its state of delivery and then come lower. All right. So the reason that we want to understand this 
is it'll help us understand breakers and mitigation blocks and stuff of, of that sort a lot easier. So let's, you know, take this understanding and let's build that to, you know, all the all the PD arrays that we're going to talk about uh, in the upcoming slides. All right. So let's move on. And then if you guys are still, you know, confused about levels of fair value, make sure that you guys go and watch our master call. We talk about this in a, in a, a little bit more in depth over there. And then you guys can, you know, gain some more insight uh, from that video. But for this video here, I think this uh, explanation is good. So I'm going to move on. All right. So mitigation blocks. All right. So what is a mitigation block? So a mitigation block is associated with the failure swing. So we have a low. We have a higher low. And then between these two areas, we're going to have a high. So that high over there is going to be your mitigation block. So that up close candle that forms this high over here is going to be your mitigation block. All right. And then a few things to know about mitigation blocks. Uh, or, yeah, the, the failure swing or the mitigation block is that the highest probability mitigation blocks have fair value gaps that are associated with them, and they also run liquidity, right? Because think about it, price is moving from, you know, from liquidity to stops, or sorry, from liquidity to inefficiencies. So in order for us to go higher, we need to pair up our orders, right? So smart money needs to pair up their orders with, you know, these willing sellers, with the willing sellers over here, and then once price fails to go below this low, that's letting us know that, hey, maybe price doesn't necessarily want to keep hunting sell stops and maybe we could go higher. And then from that, price should want to go higher over here. And then we should want to displace above this high. And that's what's going to give us that fair value gap. Because when we displace, that shows that there's institutional sponsorship behind this up move. Right, so we took out liquidity. We're failing to go below this low over here, and we're displacing above this high. So that means that maybe we're in a bullish environment, right? So that's that importance of that fair value gap. And then look right here. So let me clean up this example. So let's say that since this is a bullish example. All right, so here's that fair value gap. What are we doing here? Well, the last time that we offered sell side delivery was to get from point A to point B. And then after point B, we just offer buy side delivery. All right, so all of this is just buy side delivery. So we're inefficient up to where? Right here, which is going to correspond with this fair value gap. Right, So price should want to come down into here from a logical standpoint because it needs to deliver efficiently back down to this low. That's why this mitigation block holds weight. And that's why I say that the highest probability mitigation blocks should be accompanied with a fair value gap. And also, before we form that failure swing, we need to you know, want to take out liquidity. Right, So that's that delivery behind a high probability mitigation block. This up close candle that's over here, you know, that we say is a mitigation block, it, it doesn't mean anything without this context, right? Because at the end of the day, it's just price wanting to efficiently deliver back down into a, a level that was, you know, inefficient. And then after it's efficient, price is going to take out stops again, right? So that's that logic behind this mitigation block. Now, same thing over here. So we should want to take out liquidity. And then here's that last point over here, or sorry, before we get into that, price fails to make a higher high. So we have a high, we have a lower high. So we have a lower high over here. So price fails to go above that high. And then we should see a fair value gap over here because here's that point A, here's that point B, here's point C. How do we get from point A to point B? 
by buying up. How do we get from point B to point C? By displacing lower, right? So what does that mean? That means that we're inefficient till here, right? So that's why price is going to want to come up into there and then change its state of delivery. And that's also why we want to see, you know, maybe fair value gaps or something accompany this delivery over here, right? So price is going to want to come up to there, efficiently deliver. And then from there, it should want to change its state of delivery because at this point, price is efficient. So there's no need to go higher. And we've already taken out liquidity. So now we're going to seek some, uh, you know, more sell side liquidity below us from this point, because this is the point where we are efficient, right? So that is that delivery or, you know, that's how we understand the delivery behind a mitigation block. All right, so now let's take a look at some actual chart example. All right, so what do we have here? So right here, we take sell side liquidity. We fail to take out this low. So these lows over here fail to take out that low. All right, so here's that point A, point B, point C example, right? So we're selling off from point A to point B. We're buying up from point B to point C. So where's that area where we are efficient? It's gonna be here. And yes, I know it does overshoot it just a little, but that's fine because you know we need to understand that, you know, uh, one more thing uh, before I go into that is, so that, that's point A, point B, point C, but this area is also balanced, right? This area, look at how many times price has delivered within that area. Price has delivered once, twice, three times, right? So this area is balanced. So we shouldn't see around 50% of this level get closed through because this area is efficiently delivered. It's balanced, right? So price comes into it. Yes, it does go a little bit deeper, but let's understand the delivery. So price comes lower. And then this is the area that price changes its state of delivery from, right? And then we see the consequent higher prices as a result of this. All right, so that's that bullish example. Now let's take a look at a bearish example. All right, so what's happening here? We run sell side liquidity. This high fails to go above this high. So that's that failure swing. Here's that last down close candle that forms that low. And let's use that point A, B, and C analogy again. Point A, B, and C. So how do we get from point A to point B? By buying up. How do we get from point B to point C? by selling off and then we come back up into this area, right? So this is the last time that buy side delivery was offered. Price comes back up into this level. And then what do we do? We reprice lower, right? Because it's efficient and we're in a potential bearish market. So price reaches that level and then it comes lower from there, right? So that's your mitigation block and also Let's let's think about that from that balanced price range um, analogy that I talked about. Notice how many times price is delivered within this area. One, two, right? And then here's that third time, right? So price is already delivered buy side, sell side within this area. And then it comes to around 50%, which is permissible. And then price then drops off from there. All right, so that's that mitigation block. Now let's talk about the breaker or the order block first, and then we'll talk about the breaker. All right, so the order block. So before I talk about the order block, let me give credit where credit is due. So ICT says that, you know, a lot of people teach the order block wrong. And I'm not here to say that I know everything that ICT knows about an order block. But I can tell you, you know, um, what he has said about order blocks and what I've pieced together about order blocks and how I use order blocks in my own trading. So that's what this is. So I understand that the order block is kind of a controversial topic. And, you know, I, you know, have to give ICT credit of, you know, for that concept. So um, until ICT releases his books, you know, we won't know every single caveat to what an order block is, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we can't understand the logic behind, you know, the, the definitions that he's already given us. So with the definitions that he's given us, here is, you know, how I put it into writing. So order block is a high probability, sorry, a, a high probability bearish order block is an up close candle that either takes out liquidity 
or trades into a resistance level prior to a down move. And a high probability bearish, or sorry, bullish order block is a down close candle that takes out liquidity and or trades into a support level prior to an up move. And a high probability order block will typically be accompanied by a fair value gap. All right, so what do I mean by this? So let's say that there is liquidity here. And then let's say that this right here is that order block, right? So we take out this buy side liquidity. Buy side liquidity has been taken. And then now, you know, price starts re, uh, repricing lower, right? So here's this and here's this. So this could be that order block. Now, the significance of this and, you know, this is one way that we use an order block is, you know, this order block right here is taking out this liquidity. So that means that there's some order pairing done within this candle, right? So that's that that caveat that we use at if the X, uh, you know, when we talk about order blocks. So let's say that, you know, we had multiple candles. So it's not just a up close candle. It should be for a series of up close candles. So if we have a up close candle that's like this, and this right here, so let's say that this was the candle that closed above the liquidity, and then price displaces lower, then price should wanna come back up, and then we anticipate for most of the sensitivity to come from this candle, because this is the candle that pairs up the orders with you know this old high over here so we anticipate for this candle right here when we have a series of up close candles we anticipate for the bulk of the sensitivity to come from this area right here right and then another thing about order blocks is i talked about they need to be accompanied by a fair value gap or basically what i'm saying is that we should see displacement after this order block is formed so let's let's talk about where the order block is formed first or where the order block is validated. So after we trade below this candle's low, that's when this order block becomes validated, right? Because price is going from buy side delivery and then price is changing its state to sell side delivery after taking out its low. So that's when this order block becomes validated. Now we wanna see displacement because that creates inefficiency, right? So let's let's clear up this drawing and let me draw that back in. So here's that order block. And then we displace lower. So let's use that same analogy with the level of fair value. Buy side delivery was here, right? So point A is this candle's low, point B is this candle's high, and then point C is you know how we deliver all the way lower. So we should want to come back up into here, offer some efficiency. And then if we're still truly bearish, then price will want to come lower, right? So that's that significance of those levels of fair value. And we can use them in understanding, you know, how even this order block forms as well. All right. So with that being said, let's move on to breakers. All right, so the ICT bearish and bullish breakers. So it's similar to a mitigation block, except we understand that a mitigation block forms either a higher high or sorry, a lower high or a higher low. But in this case, when we have a breaker, price forms a high, it forms a higher high. And then, you know, we displace lower and then I like this example. Uh, I didn't draw this in. Somebody else on the internet did. So credit to them. Um, but he draws in the fair value gap because we understand that, you know, these PDRAs should be accompanied by displacement, right? Or inefficiency. Because when price comes back up into these PDRAs, it should want to offer efficiency, right? And then same thing here. For a bearish breaker, we have a low and then we have a lower low. Right? So what's happening when we're forming a lower low 
and a higher high. Well, we're taking out liquidity, as it says here. Buy side is taken there, and sell side is taken below the low right there. And then from there, price should want to displace higher, and then re-deliver back into where it was where it was inefficient. Because look, A, B, C, price should want to come back down here. And then if it's still bullish, it should want to go there. And then for this bearish, bearish example, uh, so price comes down, goes higher, then displaces lower, right? So point A, B, C, right? It's inefficient over here because we displaced through that level without offering, you know, enough counterparty at that level. And then price reaches back up. And then from there, we should want to be seeing lower prices if we're still bearish. All right, so that's that. Now, let me add, um, you know, a bit more understanding to this, right? So let me teach you guys breakers, but on steroids, right? So essentially what a breaker is, is it's just a dealing range, right? So uh, the, the breaker is a dealing range, basically, right? So we understand, or an intrabank dealing range. So price takes buy side, it takes sell side, isn't this just a breaker? Right? Because here's that high. Here's that higher high. And then we anticipate for price to want to revisit this engineering range. Why do we anticipate or want to see price to revisit that engineering range? Because point A, point B, point C. We offer buy side to get from point A to point B. We offer sell side delivery to get from point B to point C, and we don't have enough uh, buy side delivery at this level. So that's why we should want to see price go up into that level at least. Of course, we can see price work a little bit deeper inside that range, but we want to see the bulk of the sensitivity come in from here. Now, what's going to be at this level? Well, isn't there going to be a down close candle that forms this low over here? Yes, most likely, right? So that's that breaker. And then that's why we anticipate for price to come lower from a dealing range, right? Because a dealing range, one part of a dealing range is displacement, buy side and sell side sweep, and then displacement. Because, you know, as I mentioned with all those other PD arrays, we want to see some measure of inefficiency being left because that way price can come back up into it and then it'll have an excuse to then reverse from, right? So price is going to be inefficient as it's forming it. And then once price mitigates it, it becomes efficient. And then that efficiency is what sends price lower or higher, depending on, you know, what the context of the market is, right? So all this is, all this breaker is, is just a dealing range. Buy side sweep, sell side sweep, right? Displacement, we come back up into this engineering range at least. And then we come lower and then same thing here, right? We sweep sell side liquidity. We sweep buy side liquidity. We come back in and then we go higher, right? So that's, that's that advanced understanding of a dealing range and the breaker, right? So now let's move on to the next slide. So now we've covered all seven of the PD arrays. Now let's understand um, just how to use them, right? So how do we understand the change in the state of delivery a little bit better, All right? So that's what we're going to discuss in the next slide, All right? Um, or in the upcoming slide. So let's take a look at breakers first. So right here, buy side liquidity is taken, sell side liquidity is taken. This is a dealing range, right? So we displace lower, right? So we get that displacement. We come back up within this level. And then from there, price goes higher, right? So one, two, three, four, right? This is that dealing range, but it's also that breaker. Now let's understand this from the standpoint of delivery. So point A, point B, point C, All right? So how do we get from A to B? We buy up, we sell off, we're inefficient till here. And we understand that this portion of price is balanced. So we shouldn't see around 50% or so of this level uh, get close through um, or if we do go a little bit higher we should see you know price want to aggressively sell off from there otherwise we know that price is not really interested in changing its state 
right? So price comes up. Yes, it does overshoot um, a little bit and goes up towards around that equilibrium, but that's fine. And then price comes lower, right? So that's that breaker and that dealing range. And we're combining that understanding with efficient delivery. All right, so that's a bearish example. Now let's take a look at a bullish example. All right, so right here, we take sell side liquidity, we take buy side liquidity, right? We displace higher, right? Look at all these up close candles that are forming, you know, through this area, right? So the last time that sell side delivery was offered was at this level. So where does price change its state of delivery from? Well, it changes its state of delivery from right here. And then if you wanna be super specific, this area right here is that breaker, that up close candle, and the price hits it, you know, perfectly and then price reprices higher off of that and we already understand efficient delivery so i'm not going to go over that again but that's what's happening over here All right so that is your breaker all right so now this is the point where we're going to understand how we can use these pd arrays in our trading right so this is monitoring the response so we will never know which PD array will give us the change in the state of delivery? We can only monitor the response that we get from price at PD arrays, right? So people ask this question all the time. Oh, which fair value gap, which breaker, which order block is going to hold? And the answer is, it doesn't matter. Price will show you based on its response, right? So if it's not responding from that PD array, then, you know, it's most likely not going to change its state of delivery from there. And now you might be wondering, well, how do we monitor the response? What does a response look like? Well, for the sake of this free YouTube video, we're, uh, we're going to refer back to uh, something that Chris talked about in the anatomy of a dealing range video. Right. So one way that we can uh, or one way that we can kind of um, uh, see a response is if we form a dealing range or if we form a high probability pricing sequence. So let's say that, whoops, let's go back to that. So let's say that this is that array. And then let's say that price is coming back up into that area. And then we do something like this, right? So we take out buy side, we take out sell side, right? And then this is, you know, I, I taught you guys this, um, in that video from um, understanding ICT's 2022 mentorship. And I talked about how we, we can use dealing ranges or high probability pricing sequences in conjunction with that ICT 2022 model. So here's your buy side hunt, right? So buy side gets taken. Here's that market structure shift, quote unquote, right, from that level. And then why should price want to come back up into this fair value gap? Well, it's inefficient. Right, that's why, you know, ICT talks about displacement. So price comes back up, but also what's happening is one, two, three, and now we anticipate for four to happen, and give us that delivery at least down to two. Isn't this a response? Isn't this a tradable response from a PD array? Well, yes, of course it is. Right. So there's other ways that we monitor a response, but for the sake of this video, this right here is golden. Right. What I just gave you is pure gold. Now go and look for this right here, this ICT 2022 model with this dealing range understanding at PD arrays. Right. And then you can take potential, you know, trade opportunities from that level. You know, this could be a model for you right here. What I gave you right here. Right. If you understand higher time frame order flow, if you understand, you know, what the, the current draw on liquidity is. And you know which PD arrays within the range that we're working within. This right here could be a model that you use, right? So now that you understand PD arrays, and you know if you go back and watch all of our videos where we talk about market maker models and all that, if you can combine that and you can use this in your trading to understand where and how price can you know potentially change its state of delivery from these PD arrays. All right, so. I just thought that I'd throw in this extra gem for you guys because it's on our YouTube channel and, you know, maybe some of you guys didn't piece that together and, you know, maybe that's our fault, but, you know, here it is. It's it's in plain words for you guys here. This is one way that you can monitor a response 
I'm not saying that you're going to win 100% of the time. If you do this, I'm not even saying that this is our model, you know? Like, we don't trade this way. But for the sake of this YouTube video, this is a way that you can trade. You know, and if you get good at this, you can, you know, potentially uh, become profitable from, you know, trading that way. But, you know, go ahead, do your own back testing. You know, this isn't financial advice, as always. But, you know, just an idea that you can get good at. All right. So... With that being said, I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. Um, hopefully, you guys now have a more clear understanding of the delivery of these PD arrays. And now I, I hope that you guys can, you know, understand um, just how price is delivering and how these candles are printing just a little bit better. And, you know, with that being said, I'll talk to you guys next time. Cheers.